about prejudice, uh, which is chapter 13 in our social psychology uh, class. We're going to talk a little bit about um, some key terms like prejudice and stereotyping, attitudes and things that we have towards other people. We're going to talk about where it comes from and just some interesting studies um, dealing with this uh, these concepts. So first we need to define what prejudice is and this uh, is part of the you know, larger idea of attitude, which we've covered before. And if you guys remember that attitudes are composed of three major uh, components. So we have the ABCs of attitudes, A being affective uh, component, which is our emotional component. Um, we have the B being the behavioral component, and then C being the cognitive component. Well, if we look at attitudes towards other people, uh, prejudice actually falls into this uh, affective or emotional component of of um, attitudes toward toward other people, and so typically when you hear the word prejudice, okay, we think of you know this sort of negative attitude toward others, um, but but we can actually be prejudiced towards or against um, people, so we can actually have positive attitudes and feel more warmly towards an individual um, compared to another individual. And we're gonna go through some examples of those um, here in a minute. But I wanna be clear here, when we use this term prejudice for this chapter, we are going to use it um, in looking at only the negative attitude because it's easier to talk about if we can sort of define it as one thing um, and it makes more sense for some of the examples and things that we that we're going to talk about. But know that you can be, you know, you can lean toward a group of people and and be sort of um, more uh, affectionate and feel more warmth toward them than someone else. For example, if you grew up with police officers, um, you know, a lot of you have a lot of police officers and law enforcement in your family. When you see police officers, you might feel more warmly toward them versus another group of people. Whereas, you know, let's say you've never grown up with anybody uh, with a military background in your family and you don't feel especially warm towards that group. But we're going to use the prejudice term um, as being a negative or hostile attitude towards someone who is in an, a distinguishable group. And the whole the whole idea of prejudice revolves around the fact that it's simply that they're a part of this group that you feel this way towards them. So it's just based solely on membership in that particular group. If you feel a certain way toward a certain color or ethnicity of a person, everybody in that group is lumped together because they're a member of that group. If you feel a prejudice toward a certain sorority or fraternity, anybody in that fraternity or sorority, because they're a member of that group, you're going to feel that way toward that person. So... Here, <clears throat> remember that we have an attitude toward people contains the three major components. We have an affective component, a behavioral component, and a cognitive component. And so our attitude toward people is broken down into three of these three basic components. So the affective or emotional component, this is really where we see this term of prejudice. Okay, so prejudice falls into... Uh, one, the type of emotion that we feel. So remember, we did talk about the fact that it can be positive or negative, but we're going to kind of lean more toward looking this as the ho uh, hostile and negative side of thing. Um, so how, how warm do you feel toward this group? How, does this group make you feel angry? Um, not only the type of emotion, but also how extreme is that emotion? So does a group of people make you mildly uneasy? Um, do, do some people just make you outright hostile? So perhaps you are from a family that of Democrats and you were brought up sort of thinking that, you know, Republicans are, uh, they make you angry and the way that they talk and, and the way that they, you know, formulate ideas, just, you know, politics makes you really, excuse me, really heated. Well then, you know, that is a, uh, the, the, the type of emotion is a, as a, um, negative, angry emotion, a hostile emotion. And then the severity is very high. You feel very hostile toward that group. And you, you can switch that and say, growing up in a Republican family, perhaps you feel that way towards Democrats. Um, so it's not necessarily limited by one or the other. It's just, you know, we see this in 
this particular kind of, of, of um, component. So the emotional component is how you feel about it. The type of emotion also with the uh, how extreme that emotion, um, extreme uh, attitude is. You also have a, comp- a behavioral component, which is how we act on those emotions and those cognitions and thoughts that we have. So the behavioral component is where discrimination falls in. So um, discrimination is, and we're going to get into this um, much uh, in much more detail later, but this is that sort of how you act uh, when you feel hostile towards somebody of a different political party. Do you engage with them? Do you start Facebook fights with them? And <laughs> Do you ignore them? Um, so the behavioral component is how you act on how you feel about the thing. And this is where discrimination can come in because this is the discrimination is the act of which you actually following through with your feelings. And so we're going to talk about discrimination here in a minute. Um, and then cognition, the cognitive component is where we get stereotyping. And we're, again, we're going to get into stereotyping separately. Um, but this, the cognitive component is your beliefs, your thoughts that make up the attitude. So you can kind of look at this as saying, okay, well, these are the facts that I feel like belong to this group. Um, you know, so a cognitive component might include, I think that everybody who has this hair color is not as smart as people who have this hair color, because I know a lot of people who have, you know, this particular hair color and they don't seem to be as bright. Um, these are kind of like things that you feel like are beliefs or, or facts in your mind about that certain group. Maybe this particular group doesn't drive as well. They don't, you know, they don't seem to, they get in a lot more car accidents. Um, maybe this particular group isn't as smart as this other. And so these are kind of facts that you put in your head and say, okay, this is what I think. And this is where we get those stereotypes from, right? So this is where we start lumping people together in terms of abilities. So, you know, it's important to understand that the, you know, that prejudice is built on the emotional component of the attitude, but all of these components are really important for attitudes towards people. Now, one thing that's really important to consider about prejudice is it's ubiquitous. So it doesn't seem to have any sort of uh, safety net with any particular person. It affects every person. Um, It doesn't matter necessarily uh, what group or where you're from. Um, you know, it, it can be dependent on a lot of different factors, which we're going to um, talk about here in a minute. Um, but the idea is, is that uh, prejudice often flows from the minority group to the majority group and also in the other direction. Whenever we can see people being broken up into different groups of people based off of different factors um, or, or how a, a certain person will identify, that's where we're going to start to see prejudice creep up because that is a way for people to be able to categorize one another and say, well, you belong in this particular group. For example, you're this particular nationality, you're from this particular country, you're this particular race or ethnicity. Um, if you're male versus female or transgender, if you're you know, uh, gay or straight or any kind of on the spectrum in terms of not being um, heterosexual, you can, you know, be essentially pr- uh, have prejudice. Uh, somebody can be prejudiced against you for your particular sexual orientation. So how you look, um, how much you weigh, if you have disabilities, if you don't have disabilities, uh, the diseases that you might have. For example, a person who has diabetes might be treated differently than someone who has HIV. Um, you know, somebody who has hepatitis might be treated someone differently who has heart disease. Um, you know, if, if there is a drug use, for example, and you are um, somebody who ha- is battling addiction, someone might look differently upon you than if you had depression. So, I mean, there's a lot of different factors that um, and aspects of your identity that can cause you to be labeled, prejudiced against, uh, discriminated against. You can also be, uh, you can have prejudice against people based on their profession. So let's say they are a sex worker. Let's say that they, you know, are a stripper or they're exotic dancer. Um, and you know, there are a lot of people who look very, very, very much down on people who, uh, might have very, uh, well-paid jobs in different kinds of situations where they feel it's unethical or immoral, um, 
Your hobbies can also uh, lead somebody to pre- be prejudiced against you based off of, so, you know, for example, some people don't like people who play video games. And so if your hobby is to go home and, and you know, what you like to do is to sit down and play a video game or like you like to gamble or you like to go, uh, you know, do something that you find fun and is your hobby, there are people that could probably lump you in a group and say, well, I don't like you because of that particular hobby. Now, when we start taking people and putting them into categories and groups, what ends up happening is that the person loses their identity. So if you look at this person who's covered completely um, from head to toe uh, in, a, in, a, in this covering here, this niqab, uh, what you see is that, you know, you, you would say, okay, well, if you had to guess what her profession is, you probably wouldn't guess that she's actually um, a marriage counselor. Um, she is a sexual activist. She uh, is an author of a best-selling Arabic sex manual, and she lives in Dubai. So she's Muslim, but what's really interesting is that you probably would not have guessed what her profession is based off of what she looks like. And so when we start um, being prejudiced against people because of the way that they look or because of their religion or because of who they are or who we think they are and what we think their identity is and placing them in categories, this becomes really dangerous. So prejudice can lead to... Um, it, it, it can escalate and lead to things like extreme hatred. Um, this leads to people torturing others for absolutely no reason, singling them out, not even knowing why they particularly hate a group. Um, and you can see a lot of times will lead to murder, genocide, um, where uh, groups of people say, well, we don't like this religion or we don't like this group of people, so therefore we are going to try to exterminate them. And that is, you know, of course, the absolute extreme, and that's where it can escalate, and we can actually see a hostility um, start to to escalate over time, even if we don't have this escalation of torture and murder and genocide, um, even when we see people who are targets of prejudice, they definitely are going to uh, suffer in less dramatic ways. So even if this idea of, oh, okay, well, um, you know, we're not around murdering people, but I don't like this group of people. What, what ends up happening is those individuals that are pre- uh, experience prejudice, they're going to still suffer. Um, so even if they're not dying, um, they could be in a position where it can build and be really dangerous. People, for example, can commit suicide if they, um, uh, you know, go into a deep depression because of the situation that they're in and the hatred that's kind of pushed onto them. We also find that um, self-esteem takes a really big hit. So we've known from, for example, chapter six, self-esteem is a really vital aspect of a person's life. Um, who we think we are is a, is a key determinant of how we behave and who we end up becoming. And so if a person is experiencing a low self-esteem because people around them are being degrading to them because they're prejudiced, then what that ends up happening is the person feels that they're unworthy of things. And so this can actually really harm a person. It's, it's, it's one is harming their, their self-esteem and their self-worth, and it could, you know, lead to them experiencing depression and unhappiness. But also people will not take advantage of certain opportunities if they feel like they're not worth it. If they feel like, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm not even going to bother trying to get that better job. I'm not going to bother even attempting to get a a good education. Um, or I'm not going to, you know, try to, you know, have a, um, a a partner, a romantic partner, whoever, whatever it might be. If the person doesn't feel worthy, then they're not going to seek out those opportunities. And there, and, and what ends up happening is it, it limits that person's, um, different options for jobs and different options for life. And so it leads to a really um, low quality of life for that particular person. And so, and we can see this a lot of times, even in our rural area, where if you take, you know, really young children who have been sort of told, you're not smart enough, you know, you live in Appalachia, there's no way you're going to go to college, You, you know, you might as well just settle on, you know, doing you know, X, Y, Z, or, you know, working in a mine or whatever it might be. If you are brought up thinking that, then you're going to have a lower self-worth and you're not going to then set your sights higher. 
you're going to kind of limit yourself and say, well, I'm not worthy and there's no way that I can, you know, step up and be any, anything more than just X, Y, Z. And so what ends up happening is that um, the person is, you know, going to limit themselves. And we see this all the time. And we see a lot of times kids uh, come in and, and they say, well, you know, I've never been told I could go to college and I never thought that that was an option for me. And that is a direct result of prejudiced thinking. Now, we've talked about the affective or emotional component of prejudice. Now, the cognitive, we're skipping to the cognitive component, and we're going to pop back to the behavioral component here in a minute. But the cognitive component is where we get stereotypes and stereotypical sort of thoughts, okay? So a stereotype is this generalization about a group of people, and we put people into these categories and assign all members of the group these identical characteristics, regardless of how different the people in the group are. And once we form these stereotypes, they are very resistant to change, even when new information is provided. You kind of root that into your thought process and you go, okay, all the people who are in this group belong to this group. And I'll give you guys a few examples. So if you were to have a person, for example, a man who has a beard, he's wearing a head covering, you have a, a, a black male, you have an Asian female, and you say, okay, well, where do they belong? Okay, who is the one with a really good financial job that's out here, you know, working, um, you know, a, a, a really high education, high paying job? Who's the one who's going to be likely to blow something up? I mean, to be a terrorist and who's going to be likely to play basketball. And if you were to use your stereotypical thought processes, you know, you may come to a particular conclusion. But what we've found is that not everybody fits those stereotypes, right? So, you know, it's, it's harmful to place everybody in these categories and boxes when in reality, we might find that it's not the black man who plays the basketball. It's not this person wearing head covering that's blowing things up. And it's not this Asian woman who has this really good high paying job. And I'll give you guys examples of how this actually works out. So here we have this particular woman and it's Manahel Tibet. And she was the youngest person to ever receive a financial engineering PhD. And she graduated magna cum laude, which is a really high honor. So she did this at 25. She's from Yemen and she's an economist and scientist. She earned her degree at the University of Illinois. And she's also working towards a second PhD in quantum mathematics, which is ridiculous because just one PhD is seriously enough work. She came up with a revolutionary 350-page formula to calculate distance in space without the use of light back in 2012. She has um, uh, uh, an IQ that's higher than 168. She was given um, uh, several different awards. She was given a humanitarian award for her efforts in the United Nations. She was given Woman of the Year Award. Uh, from the Women's Federation of World Peace or for World Peace. She is extremely accomplished um, and she's from Yemen and she's a woman and many people wouldn't have associated her with this such a such a intelligent career and amazing sort of genius level capacity. Um, if we look at this example, so this particular uh, girl or woman, she, her name is Jalen Young, and she's an American um, from Mississippi. In 2015, she attempted to move to Syria with her fiancé, who is an American, uh, to join ISIS to work as a medic. And uh, she was apprehended by the FBI. She ultimately pled guilty um, to terrorism-related charges. So, you know, you see a young black woman and you go, oh, that's not a terrorist, Okay, but in this case, you know, this didn't fit the stereotype. Um, and in here, many of you probably know Jeremy Lin. Jeremy Lin is an American professional basketball player. He played for the uh, Toronto Raptors. He is um, the first American of chi Chinese or Taiwanese descent to play in the NBA. Um, and he is actually one of the few Asian Americans to play in the league overall. And he's um, known for uh, his public expression of Christianity 
and he it was helpful uh, winning a turnaround um, uh, game with the New York Knicks back in 2012. So, I mean, he is definitely someone that you look at and go, well, you know, that doesn't make sense for the stereotype. But when we box people up and put them into categories, then we end up losing that person's identity and limit them. So she may never have gone in and, you know, gotten a fantastic career. He may never have been an amazing basketball player. If people keep breaking down and saying that they're not worth it or they're not made for that. Now, remember that stereotyping is cognitive. It's not emotional. Just because somebody's being uh, stereotypical or stereotyping someone actually does not lead to intentional acts of abuse. Because remember, this is not the behavioral component. This is the cognitive component. What this does, what stereotyping is, is essentially how we put people in categories and boxes to better understand the world and to more quickly navigate our environment. Now, we've talked about this a lot in in previous classes, and I want to make sure that we all understand that we all do this, okay? And the the reason why we do it is to simplify how we look at the world. So we've talked before about how there are certain schemas that we have. You guys remember we talked about schemas. We talked about ways that we put people in boxes and things and in boxes and categories. When we're learning how to learn language, okay, we start off learning the difference between dogs and cats and cows and horses. And we put animals in categories to know, okay, well, this big animal is black with spots on it with white spots. Is it a is it a horse or is it a cow? Well, depending on what the animal looks like, it could be either one. Um, you know, being able to tell the difference between types of dogs, being able to tell the difference between types of of cats and and a cat, a house cat versus a, a cougar or a lion. And so this process is not I I don't want to I don't want to downplay the how negative stereotyping can be. I want to express how it is a, it is just a uh, technique that we are sort of, um, uh, sort of predestined to to do from very young age, from a very young age to learn and understand language. So the reason why we do it is so that we can more quickly navigate our environment. It's the law. It's like the law of least effort. It's a way for us to be able to maximize our cognitive time and energy so that that way we can throw people in categories and know very quickly, do I want to communicate with this person? Do I want to interact with this person or do I want to just leave them alone? Okay. And so uh, even though stereotyping is, can be a very negative thing, it is a natural thing that we do and we all do it to some extent. So I'm not downplaying the importance or how how bad it can be for particular people. I'm just relaying the fact that it's something that we do because that's sort of how our brains work. Now, it can be very dangerous, okay? Both positive stereotypes, okay? So putting people into a group that, you know, oh, okay, you're a black male, you must be good at basketball, right? You're an Asian uh, man, you must be great at math right? Those are positive stereotypes or negative stereotypes. Regardless, both can be harmful. When we talk about positive stereotypes, what we're doing is we're taking away the individuality of the person. So for example, not all African-American kids are great at basketball. There are plenty of white kids that are great at basketball. Um, If we take a, a young black man and he's not good at basketball, okay, and we're surprised and astonished, okay, we're divine, def- uh, we are denying that person his, his individuality. What if he's super fantastic at math? What if he's amazing at engineering? You know, we're taking away some of his great qualities by lumping him together into a group and saying, well, you must have this talent because you belong to this group. And that can be really dangerous. Another area that we see this in being potentially dangerous is in the case of gender. So when we traditionally stereotype men versus women, we usually see women as more socially sensitive, as friendlier, 
more concerned with the welfare of others, whereas men we tend to see as being more dominant, more controlling, and more independent. Now, there's two versions of sexism. Both actually have the same underlying base, but we're going to discuss these and in, in how they can be really dangerous in terms of being stereotypical. So hostile sexism, this is when we see very stereotypical views of women that suggest that women are inferior to men. So hostile sexism would be that women are less intelligent, less competent than men, and saying, oh, you don't deserve to be in that job because you're not smart enough. A man should do that job because you're not smart enough. So it would be like saying, I'll never vote for a woman president because I don't think a woman could ever do as good of a job as a man. That is hostile sexism. By saying, you know, um, in a hostile way, you are inferior because you're a woman to a man. That's hostile sexism. Now, another kind of sexism that we don't talk too much about, but one thing that does exist is called benevolent sexism. Now, benevolent sexism is really interesting. It's a very typical, stereotypical, very positive view of women. Okay, so this is where it can get confusing. Both of these are rooted in the same idea, okay? But this benevolent sexism looks a whole lot nicer, okay? Because this is where we're seeing that women, so so benevolent sexists tend to really uh, look at women uh, in a romantic way. They're going to admire them as wonderful cooks and mothers. They want to protect them. You know, they say, you know, um, I love my mother and I love my grandmother and they're special, very fragile and I can't, you know, I, I can't let them get hurt and I can't expose them to anything, okay? So benevolent sexism looks at women still as being weaker and in, in need of protection. So what these two have in common is that women are still inferior, they're, they're the weaker sex. So in this case, in, in hostile sexism, it's blatant, you're not as smart as us, you're not as good as us, you're not as strong as us, okay, men compared to women. With benevolent sexism, it is, oh, you know, um, women uh, need to be protected because they're, uh, they're, they're weaker and they're inferior, but I love them and they're amazing cooks and I admire my mother and I think she's amazing. You know, so even though we see two kind of, uh, we see a hostile sexism as being a negative thing and benevolent sexism being a positive thing, they are still rooted in the fact that women are seen as the weaker sex. And so when you, even though, you know, there's one kind of positive side and one kind of negative side, you end up still with the same result. And that is that women aren't given certain opportunities and women are looked down upon um, overall. Now, let's get to uh, <coughs> this idea <coughs> about negative emotion. Excuse me. Now, <clears throat> negative emotion, okay, about groups and an idea of prejudice is often ingrained, right? We talked about the fact that once you have established stereotypes, which are the cognitive component, that's when you're going to see it being really difficult to budge, okay? Um, Attitudes are really difficult to dispel when emotion and cognition are rooted very deeply in the same sort of area. So here we're going to move now into the final component, which is the behavioral component, which is the discrimination. So when it comes to discrimination, this is the action, right? This is the behavior. So you can have certain prejudice, affective feelings toward a particular group, but never really act on them. Um, and you can have thoughts about particular groups, but again, never really act on them. But the behavioral component contains that I, the ideas where you actually act on it. And, and this is where we lead to things like discrimination. So discrimination, it would be any kind of unjustified, negative or harmful action toward a particular person um, because they belong to a specific group. So discrimination might be saying, 
I don't believe that women are as smart as men. Therefore, I am in HR, I'm in human resources, and I'm not going to hire a woman for this job. That would be a really clear-cut example of discrimination. Because what ends up happening is you have a, a particular feeling toward a, per, a, a group, right? In this case, it would be women. You have, um, you know, a particular emotion. You feel very strongly that they uh, uh, are not as, that, that, that they're inferior. And perhaps you even hate women, okay? You don't like them because, you know, you, you, don't, you don't like the way they act. Then you have this cognition, which is the stereotyping that women aren't as smart, right? So this is a belief or a thought or a fact in your mind that you say women aren't as smart as men. And so you combine this, this, this cognition and this affect, this emotion, and then you further that by behaving in a way that is in line with your emotion and your cognitions. And so in this case, the behavioral component would be you discriminating against a woman by not hiring that woman for a job that she's actually qualified for. So discrimination can come in a lot of different ways. And again, you can discriminate based on really any kind of identity or group or whatever it might be. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty much limitless in terms of how, how you can categorize people um, in those particular ways. But the discrimination part is the actual act. It is the behavioral component. How do you act toward those individuals? If you see a person of a certain ethnicity cross the, uh, across the street or on the same side of the street as you, then you cross the street to get away from them. That is an act, right? You are behaving in a certain way that is actually following through with some of your cognitions and your emotions. So if people scare you, for example, you don't want to be near them and you move away from them, that would be a behavioral, the behavioral component of your, of your attitude. Now, another thing we've talked a little bit about is this idea of microaggression. So microaggression is something that a lot of people don't realize that they do. Um, but it is very, it can be, um, it can really add up to be, um, uh, uh, to especially eventually, if you're dealing with this on a daily basis, every single day you're going out and you're dealing with this, um, it can really add up to be negative toward the person. So uh, a microaggression is any slight. It's an indignity. It's a put down that's directed at, for example, minorities. It can be directed at people with disabilities. Um, and so a lot of times it kind of looks like a compliment, but it's backhanded, okay? And so, for example... When it comes to a person who is of a particular ethnicity, let's say um, uh, there's an Asian American and somebody says, wow, you're really articulate or you have you know, really great English, you have really excellent English. The person might have been in the United States their entire life, they might have been born in America to American parents, but they just might be you know, of a different ethnicity. Um, and so you're assuming that the person's not going to speak very good English. So when you tell somebody, oh, wow, you have great English that is a microaggression, okay? It's a slight, to put down. Even though it might have been kind of meant to be a positive thing, okay? It is it actually not. You know, telling somebody, oh, wow, um, you know, you have beautiful hair for a black girl. You know, that is, again, it's, it's a slight. It's like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to put you in this category and say, well, you have beautiful hair, not generally, okay? Your hair isn't just beautiful. It's only beautiful in your category, Um you know, saying that somebody is a better driver than you expected um, is, again, is a put down. Um, you know, saying that asking people where they're really from. And we've used this example in class before of saying, um, OK, well, you know, uh, different comedians have done this. Like a season. Sorry, I said, OK, well, you know, where are you really from? And he's like South Carolina. Well, he's Indian. Um, you know, of Indian descent. And he knows what people mean, but he is just being silly because people ask him this question all the time. So they say, well, where are your parents from? And then he says, you know, another state. And so um, the problem with these microaggressions and with discrimination is that when we look at people with stereotypical uh, lenses, what happens is, is that you then act differently toward them. So for example, let's say you're a math teacher and let's say you're a fourth grade math teacher and you feel like girls are not as good as boys in math. You're going to spend less time with girls in the classroom, less time coaching them, less time helping them 
than perhaps um, little boys in your class or fourth grade boys. If you are a police officer and you feel like, um, you know, uh, African Americans are more violent than, than white people, this might actually affect your behavior. You might be more likely to engage in uh, more deadly force, you know, if you feel that people are more dangerous. So these can really lead to really small things throughout the day or it can lead to really big things that are life-threatening. So here's a few examples of um, what we call implicit prejudices. And so, again, these are microaggressions that somebody's saying to, the, to these individuals um, based off of a group that they belong in. And so what ends up happening is that, you know, we see these sort of implicit um, prejudices. And I would say, uh, you know, up and, you know, up until maybe five or 10 years ago, um, that implicit racism was really, really rooted. Um, this is where you see a lot of, of the racist comments is, is more implicit, more microaggressions, nothing really hostile and blatant. But over the course of the past few years, um, it's become much more apparent. And we're actually seeing what we call explicit racism and explicit prejudice, where people will just come out and say things that aren't microaggressions, that they are full-on aggressions. And so this can be extremely dangerous for different groups. Um, and, you know, kind of has that sort of, and we're going to talk about conformity a little bit later on, this sort of conformity effect where, uh, you know, people are kind of ganging up on, on individuals because they feel like they're safe being outwardly or explicitly hostile. So we have to be really careful about this. Um, you know, it's not to say that microaggressions are any better, uh, but they, and they, they tend to chip away at people over time and, and, and it gets really difficult for a person to have to experience that over and over again every single day. So, um, you know, the first step is really understanding where your attitude you're coming from and being able to say, Am I saying these statements, you know, am I, am, 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 am I, you know, um, adding to this person's bad day and being able to be aware of what kind of implicit biases you might have is an important first step to being able to, to alleviate this. Now, how do we get rid of prejudice and stereotypical behavior um, how do we approach this in a way that makes sense and says, okay, well, you know, do we, what do we do to try to get people to get along better and to not be scared of each other or angry at each other, or hostile to each other? And so the idea is, is like, oh, okay, well, we'll just put people together, right? Let's, let's, you know, desegregate schools and let's, um, throw people from different groups in the same group and see what happens. Well, we've learned that that doesn't really work. Okay. So just mere contact between groups of people doesn't reduce prejudice. In fact, it can actually make things a lot worse. Um, it can increase uh, and create opportunities for conflict that can, can increase the separation between groups. So if you, there's a really, really interesting, um, there's, there's some interesting pictures out there about different types of, um, of movie uh, production sets. And I can't off the top of my head remember exactly what it was, but I think it was um, there was a particular movie set where people were dressed as different characters. And so, um, you know, those characters who were more similar, uh, like, quote unquote, the same species of alien, for example, all sat together. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the different kinds of groups of people will find each other. And if they feel more similar, they're going to group together. We see this in in the in the first you know few years of desegregation in schools where even though you know you have everybody of the same uh, of different ethnicities in the same school, people will clump together based off of similarities. So people who are Hispanic might clump together, people who are African American might clump together, uh, Caucasian people will clump together and group together even though they're they're desegregated. Um, and so, you really find this happening. Um, oh, I think the the movie was um, Planet of the Apes, and so they were all dressed as different apes, so orangutans and chimpanzees, and you can actually see. And in then this was the original movie. I believe it was shot in the nineteen sixties. You can actually see a production photo of them at lunch, and they're they're literally sitting together as what kind of uh, species that they are, and it's just really interesting example of how we pick people 
who we feel more comfortable and similar to, and then and then we're going to kind of see that as in our in group, and then everybody else is our, our out group. And so, simply putting a bunch of people together of different ethnicities or different races or different religions is not going to solve the contact. Mere contact does not solve prejudice. What has to happen um, in in the case of putting people together is there has to be two conditions. Number one, both groups have to be of equal status. You can't throw people together who are of different um, education levels or different socioeconomic status or anything like that. They have to be of equal status and they have to share a common goal. And we find that prejudice does decrease when you have these two conditions that are met. And the reason why we know this is because of a really interesting study done in the 1960s by Sheriff. And so he did this um, particular experiment um, with young boys uh, where he basically had camps. And so he had two different camps with young boys. I believe they were around 11, 12 years old. And um, the the key here was that all of the boys were white They all came from about the same kind of background. So there wasn't like wealthy kids or poor kids. Everybody came from about the same background. Um, And he split them into two different camps. And he actually was able to create a divide between these two camps. And so um, what ended up happening was, uh, you know, they had a lot of competitions and they created such a animosity and hostility between the groups that they would do things like raid each other's rooms. Um, There was a huge uh, food fight in the cafeteria and they were able to really get them to, to hate each other, these two different groups. Well, they had a situation where they said, okay, well now we have stereotyping, we have prejudice, we have people who are, you know, hating each other. How do we fix it? So what they uh, ended up doing was they, because they were like, well, let's bring them together in the cafeteria. We'll have uh, a meal and you know, break bread and everybody be fine. And that's when the food fight broke out. And so this isn't working. This mere contact isn't working. So what they ended up doing was uh, sabotaging their water supply for both camps. So they both, the, all the boys from both camps had to work together in a common goal to get their water back. Because if not, they, they wouldn't be able to have, you know, uh, drinking water. And what they found is that when they gave them a common goal, they came together and they stopped being hostile and hating each other. This is a really interesting experiment, but it's not necessarily realistic in the sense of, okay, how do we do this in real life? When you have people of different um, statuses, you have people of different groups, and, you know, they're not always going toward the same goal. So... My solution is probably the best thing is to have one goal. Like, for example, if aliens came and decided to try to destroy the earth, we would have one common enemy across the entire earth or the entire United States. And then we would, you know, uh, try to attack that enemy together. And so that would actually provide a little bit more cohesion and less hostility between people because there's a common goal. We can almost see this in what's happening with the coronavirus and COVID-19, people are trying to work together to get rid of this kind of, this foreign enemy, right? This, this virus. But getting back to this idea of what works um, in these experiments. So again, a caveat is, you know, this idea of status, um, of, of, you know, looking at some of the elements and conditions that work to reduce prejudice okay in the in terms of contact and a lot of this information some of this information came from the sheriff study and then some came from some uh some older studies well the first one is called mutual interdependence and this is when we see that each party's success is going to depend on the other party's success so um we had jigsaw classrooms that really showed um, that this works really well in terms of uh, the desegregation um, of, of um, schools in the 1960s because we would have, you know, one school with the black and white kids and they wouldn't, they wouldn't work together, okay? They, they, they separated themselves, they segregated themselves. 
when you created jigsaw classrooms, everybody was responsible for a piece of something like, um, you know, you have four kids in a group and some might be white and some might be black, but everybody's responsible for a piece of that assignment or that activity. And so you have a mutual interdependence across the board because you can't do the other person's part. Everybody's got to do an equal part. And then you come together and then you put those parts together to, to accomplish a goal. So that's a really interesting sort of side of things. And it worked really well in desegregation of schools. Um, you have to have a common goal, right? This is similar to the sheriff study with that common goal being uh, the fixing the water supply. But this is a superordinate goal that takes higher priority than other concerns like hating each other or disliking each other and could potentially unite people despite other conflicts that they might have. The equal status thing, again, coming from the sheriff's study, um, the uh, specific groups of, of kids that they had come together were very much the same in terms of status and power. No one was the boss. No one was uh, you know, more or less powerful. Um, so even though this particular example had kids coming from the same sort of background, if we can put people together who do come from different backgrounds, but make sure that nobody has an, a higher status than someone else. So don't put somebody in charge as the boss. Um, you know, don't put somebody unequal to someone else. Then that can work to provide equal status. So if there's no status differences, um, then you're going to find that it's going to work a little bit better. When you have a boss, the person's going to act like a stereotypical boss. When you have an employee, okay, they're going to act like a stereotypical subordinate. And so that can uh, cause issues when you're trying to, you know, sort of bring people together. So if you're going to have people together of different statuses, make sure that nobody gets um, an unequal or nobody gets a, a status above someone else in the group. There should be a friend, friendly informal setting. Um, so it needs to, uh, ha you need to have a situation where in-group members can interact with out-group members on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and you know, just putting people in a room uh, where they can remain segregated is not really going to promote their understanding or knowledge of each other or reduce the segregation or reduce the prejudice in those groups. Number five is really important. Knowing multiple out-group members. So you can actually see this a lot of times in different examples where a person's like, well, I don't have anything wrong with, you know, I have a black friend. I have one black friend and that black friend is amazing and great. Um, but I don't particularly like, you know, this uh, people of, you know, this is an example, you know, of this group. But this one person's okay because they're different. They're an exclusion. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're an exception to the norm. And so that's the danger of only having one outgroup member that you, that you know or that you're friends with. I'll give you guys another example of a study that was done. So um, there were male police officers who were asked, do you think female police officers are as good as male police officers? And this study was done in Washington, D.C. in the 70s. And so uh, the, the, male, the male officers who said, no, I don't believe that women are as good as cops. I don't think they're as strong. I don't think they're as intelligent. I don't think they're as fast. I don't think that their performance is up to, to a male standard. What they did is they paired those men with female partners for a period of time. And then they were asked afterward, how do you feel about women officers and their expectations and their thoughts did not change at all. They still said, well, no, I don't think that women are as good and I don't think they're as smart and as fast and as strong. And so they were asked, well, you have a, a female partner. Do you not think your partner is as good as you? And they would say, oh, no, 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 no. My female partner is fantastic, um, but she's an exception. She's not the norm. And so having one member of the outgroup that you know does not change things at all. It just makes you think that that person is an exception to the norm. And they're still going to keep the same um, perceptions as they did prior to that, you know, knowing that person. So you have to know multiple members of the outgroup in order to say, okay, 
I see that individuals within a group are actually much more different than they are alike. And I can't clump these people together because of a stereotypical thought that I had prior to this. The last one is that uh, the, this idea of social norms of equality. Now, this is extremely dependent on society. Okay. So you, in order to reduce prejudice, social norms have to promote and support equality among groups. And if those social norms are not there to say, um, you know, these groups are equal or these groups are, you know, um, there's no difference between these groups, then what ends up happening is if, if, you know, these are really, really powerful. Social norms are very, very powerful. And they can motivate people to reach out to members of the out group and motivate people to see the differences um, of, you know, of, of why stereotypes aren't, don't apply to everybody in that group and why they shouldn't categorize people. If there is an environment to promote equality, then we're going to see that sort of spreading through um, individuals and their thought processes. Um, for example, you can see this in social media, you can see this on the street, you can see this, how people view other people. Um, and so the idea is, is that if you can get society on board with equality, okay, then individuals will come around. And if you promote this environment of equality, then you're going to see prejudice reduce for those different groups. So those are the six conditions where we see contact actually does reduce prejudice. So if you have any questions about any of this, you know, you can email me and you can ask me any of this uh, information and, um, you know, use this to make sure that you understand the concepts for your next quiz. And 